Well, good evening, y'all. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. We just have, we're coming in on the uh, tail end of everything. Uh, we just have maybe three more classes, including this one tonight. Uh, it just depends on how fast we want to go. I feel like I went a little too fast last week. Uh, is that your feeling as well? Maybe. Um, well, I will just cover chapter 8 tonight, okay, in, in my book, which includes, it starts at Revelation 15 through Revelation 18. So we're covering three chapters in Revelation. Uh, the cycle of the seven bowls, the third cycle of three, or third cycle of seven, rather, um, and the Battle of Armageddon. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we got fun stuff tonight, too. Um, and so we're, I'm just going to try to cover that tonight, chapters 15 through 18 of Revelation, which is just chapter 8 in my book. Okay? Does that sound good to everybody? Yes. Okay. Everybody feeling okay? Doing well? Good. Welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, as we were assembling and getting ready for stuff, Chris had asked me a question, and he said, how in the world was it that the book of Revelation wound up as part of the canon of Scripture? You know, those official books... Because I don't know if you've had much experience in reading some of the, the books, the Gospels, the epistles, the other writings that didn't make the cut, so to speak, uh, in what's called the canon. So this word canon, when I use it, I don't mean something that goes boom and <laughs> fires things. Um, so the word canon in Egyptian meant a reed. Like the reeds that grow on the side of the Nile. And they all grow about the same height. It's about three feet tall. And every one of them, there's a you know a little variation of about an inch or so. But they use those reeds, since they all grew about the same height and were super accessible because you just go out to the river and pluck one. Uh, it's, it's a nice yardstick, basically. So it was really good for measuring fabric, for measuring lengths of whatever. Uh, so the canon became known in Christian scripture terms as that which made the cut, which measured appropriately. And one of those measures was whether or not the author was one of the disciples or knew Jesus. That was a big one. Another one was what that influence that this person who wrote whatever had on the early Christian community, okay? And there's some other ones too. Um, if you ever read some of these apocryphal, that's a, a word that goes along with this. Um, the apocrypha is, refers to a section of books in between the Old Testament and the New Testament which the Roman Catholic Church still recognizes as part of the canon, as does the Episcopal Church. Um, and Martin Luther didn't like them particularly, so he kind of shoved them away into the back corner. Uh, most free church folks, like Baptists and that sort of thing, most of them never even heard of them. Um, but they're kind of intertestamental or apocrypha. Um, and so the apocrypha or apocryphal is the adjective form of those books are um, ones that are kind of quasi-scripture. You know, um, most Protestants see them as similar, if not almost scripture or totally scripture. Um, but I doubt that most people have read them. Have any of y'all ever read some of them before? I've read yeah. Tobit. Tobit, oh, that's a good one. I read Judith. And Judith, uh, <laughs> there's one called uh, Susanna, or its Greek title, Bell and the Dragon. Oh much my. more fun thing. <laughs> uh, there is uh, Second Esdras, or Fourth Ezra, um, and depending on whether or not it's written in Greek or Hebrew, 
Uh, and that one is a an apocryphal, I'm sorry, an apocalyptic book. With a, it's a Jewish apocalypse with a Christian prologue and epilogue. <laughs> which so that one, one? Which one? Esdras. Esdras. Yes. Okay. Uh, second Esdras or fourth Ezra. Gotcha. Um, that one is an advanced apocalyptic apocalyptic book. If you want to try that on after you get your feet wet with Revelation. Um, and there's a couple all in that too. Book? What's that? Are they all in that book? If you get that Bible, you that can get them. My, uh, my Bible, for instance, um, if you're ever wondering what the best Bible is, well, it's the one you read. However, <laughs> the best Bible not, um, is either this one, which is the Harper Collins Study Bible, which is an, a New Revised Standard Version translation, or there's another one called the Oxford Annotated. Oh, I got, I have and uh, that one is also an NRSV. Uh, both of them have really good notes. And one of the things I like about that one is if the Greek or the Hebrew are not very clear, which happens a lot, trust me, <laughs> um, there are lots of times when we just can't figure out the right way to translate a sentence uh, for some of these things. Imagine trying to duplicate English with only the works of Shakespeare. Okay? That'd be hard, wouldn't it? Like, if you only had the words mentioned in Shakespeare's plays, and you had a corpus of Shakespeare's words, and you tried to, and you tried to rock make and roll English, by Shakespeare. Well, or you tried to, you know, just have English as a language based off of that and figure that out. I mean, that's in essence what we have here with Greek and Hebrew in lots of ways. Um, so it, you can see how, how difficult that can be at times. And there are oftentimes things that occur only once. Words, phrases, grammatical situations that occur only once. That's a fancy word for that. It's called hapax legomena. Um, so you can throw that out at your That sounds like parties. a medicine you take. Uh, Hopox legomena. Uh, so anyway, uh, but that's that's super high class there. We won't go there tonight. Um, but all of this stuff being said, uh, to answer your question, Chris, um, is how did Revelation get as part of the canon? Well, it was written by a guy who had the name of John. That helped, uh, even though it was likely not John the disciple, who's still named John. Um, and given the close proximity that Nicaea was, y'all heard of the Nicene Creed, right? Number 880 in our hymnals. Uh, well, that was done in 325 AD, and it was a really major conference of all the prominent bishops in the world, in the Mediterranean world at the time. And so they all got together because there were a lot of, there were a lot of crazy people, just like now. <laughs> and there were some people who were really crazy and who had attracted a lot of followers. Were they um, Methodists? No, they were Methodists oh. at that point. Uh, we didn't come along until 1,500 <laughs> years later. Uh, but um, there, were, uh, there was a lot of diversity, and still is a lot of diversity within what we would call Christianity. Um, but a big group of all the bishops uh, got together to decide what books were scripture and which ones weren't. And in Judaism, they had just recently done that in Alexandria about 100 years previously. Uh, so it's not as though uh, Christianity was alone in not knowing which set of books was scripture and which ones were just interesting. <laughs> you know. Um, and so the reason Revelation was included in this was because um, it was written by a guy named John who just happened to be the same name as John the disciple. Even though it's very unlikely as I've shared with y'all in my opinion at least that it was John the disciple because his Greek is horrible. And John the Disciples' Greek is amazing. Um, which is not to say that John the Disciple wrote either of those. 
But anyway. How about first, second, and third? The first, second, third was That's written by somebody topic. else entirely too, <laughs> if you ask me. But anyway, um, I don't want us to get too bogged down in all of that. But as early as 150 AD, uh, this guy named Origen, um, write his name down so you can see it. So O-R-I-G-E-N. He was a prominent early Christian theologian, church father, we might say. And uh, Origen was a little bit crazy. He castrated himself because he felt like he lusted too much. Okay, that's that dude. There we go. Uh, now, he wasn't exactly uh, uh, orthodox, as we might say. So the word orthodox means right um, practice, right thinking. Um, so uh, he wasn't exactly what we might call Orthodox Christian, but he was a prominent early Christian, um, despite those sort of things. Uh, but before you but start, didn't get too many to follow, too many people to follow that sect. I didn't know. <laughs> but, well, I mean, what about Abraham? You know, he has to go and tell all his people, "Hey, so uh, God has chosen us to be His special people." And all we have to do is mutilate our genitals. <laughs> anyway, okay, so um, like, like I've said before, um, my ethics professor at Duke, Stanley Howard Wass, he used to say a religion wasn't worth having if it didn't tell you what to do with your pots and your pans and your genitals. <laughs> so there you go. Um, Got to have fun with all this. But um, so to answer Chris's question, finally, after so long, I've been going on this for 15 minutes, to answer Chris's question as to why is uh, the book of Revelation in our Bible, I would say the, the short answer is because it was written by a guy named John. And a slightly longer answer is Nicaea was geographically really close to Western Turkey where John was a, a prominent um, preacher, traveling preacher, one might even say martyr to some extent, uh, even though we don't know exactly what happened to him. Um, and uh, so, but Origen, this guy I was telling you about, by 151 AD, I think it was when he mentioned, he said that nobody understands this book. We don't know why it's still so important. Um, as early as 150 AD. Well, yeah, the apocalypse hasn't happened yet. Well, part, well, so to back up just a bit, part of the reasoning was is that apocalyptic literature was a peculiarly, it's such a hard word to say, peculiarly Jewish form of writing. And by, you know, the longer you go out, the more Christianity becomes a Gentile movement instead of a Jewish sect. Um, and so it makes sense that, you know, in not many generations, the understanding of how to interpret this book kind of fell by the wayside for years and years and years. Um, centuries and centuries and centuries, one would say. It wasn't until the 1950s that we discovered a lot of the... Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi Scrolls and Papyruses, um, and started to see, oh, wait a minute, there are all these other writings that follow the same sort of uh, themes uh, and symbols and all that. So, um, long story short, which I don't like to do, I like to take a short story and make it long. <laughs> Sprinkle some fairy dust on That's the way it's supposed to be. That's what preachers do. Um, but, uh, why is Revelation in our Bibles? If John had been named Leroy, I don't know <laughs> that it would be. Um, the apocalypse, according to Leroy, just doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? No. Um, but anyway. One quick question. Oh, I all don't know Bible, if we do those. All the Bible is first Hebrew, then it was Greek, and and what we're talking about, the legitimacy of the Bible, is an Egyptian word. Yes. Egyptian culture was just as important as Greek culture 
in the ancient Near East. And I would argue that Egyptian culture was more important than Roman culture in many areas, particularly what we would call Israel and the Holy Land. Okay. Um, Egyptian culture had just as much bearing, if not more, um, than Greek and Roman culture. Phoenician culture, mm -hmm. which is somewhat Greek, um, had a lot of bearing. Babylonian culture had a lot of bearing, but also uh, Egyptian culture. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, so I have a class ring from Duke. It's got my name inscribed inside it in case I lose it. It's got a little inscription of the chapel here in the year I graduated with my master's, 2004, 2004, and my degree, Master of Divinity, right here, the little seal of the school. And so if I were to take this and put it in wet clay, that would be like signing your name, okay? Um, and so everyone would have a ring, a signet ring, and it would generally flip. So you would have a part up here at the top where the, the band would wrap around. Here, let me just draw it. It's easier than explaining it. So you would have a signet ring. And so right here, where these parts are, it would flip, okay? And on the bottom of it, so let's say the ring looks like this. It would have hieroglyphs. That's not real hieroglyphs, I'm just scribbling, but anyway. So that's what the bottom of it would look like. The top of it would look like this, but it would be kind of raised, you know? So mm -hmm. try to shade it to where it's... Um, so you would take your ring off, you flip it over to the bottom to where this hieroglyph is that has your name on it. And then you would press it in on some wet clay. And that's called a bulla, singular B-U-L-L-A. Um, plural is a bullae, B-U-L-L-A-E. Um, and you'd press that into the clay and that was your signature. Um, and so this is Egyptian not anything else. Um, so anyway, we get um, that sort of thing happening. You say everyone had one. Well, anybody who was important enough to sign something. And the women did. The women would have had one. Just <laughs> Yeah. Well, some women might have. They might have had their husbands. If their husband was deceased, I mean, there were... Cleopatra might have Cleopatra had her own. Cleopatra might have had her own, yeah, exactly. Hers would have some snakes right here, you know. Or anyway. But, um, so Egyptian culture is much more prominent than Greco-Roman culture in Ashkelon, where I was digging, which is the next city up from uh, Gaza, um, which is geographically very close to Egypt. Um, and it was one of the five cities of the Philistine Pentapolis. So we're uh, Samson and Delilah were from that city. And Ashkelon had a lot more Egyptian influence than it did Greco-Roman or even Phoenician influence. So anyway. I, I know when we were in Greece a couple years ago, there was several museums that you know where they had the, a lot of the statues and stuff and, and there was there was a lot of even in Greece there was a lot of Egyptian yeah influence. yeah so there's a lot of the statues I mean, that were very Egyptian and and even in the Roman Empire most fit Greek was the main language not Latin I mean they used Latin because it was their like but Greek was by far and away way more prominent than than Latin was if you went off to university or the equivalent of it had some tutoring, you'd get tutored in Greek long before you got tutored in Latin. Um, so anyway, used to be that was the sign of a good education. Get tutored in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. I mean, yeah. Of course, that's what somebody who majored in that sort of thing would say. But anyway. All right, well, let's start 
with um, Revelation 15. Sound good? Uh, then I saw another portent in heaven, great and amazing, has seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them the wrath of God is ended. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, you remember what we talked about last week, uh, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God, the Almighty, just and true are your ways, King of the nations, Lord, who will not fear uh, and glorify your name. For you are alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. Um, anybody know the first verse of Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing? Is it a Oh, for, for a thousand tongues to sing my great, great Redeemer's praise, tis beauty of my God and King. The glory of my God and King, the triumph of His grace. Well, what we have here is likely um, a, same, a similar sort of thing. This is likely one of those hymns that the early church, particularly in Western Turkey, would have known and sung. Um, so, after this I looked, and the temple of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues, robed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes across their chest. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were ended. Um, that was pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but before I go on, I want to stop and see if there are any questions. It's interesting that it says uh, the song of Moses. Did you hear that again? Another reference back to Egypt and the, uh, the Exodus. Um, and then being freed from slavery. So, okay to move on? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> um, Revelation 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and a foul and painful sword came upon those who had the mark of the beast and who had worshipped its image. Second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, You are just, O holy one, who are and were, for you have judged these things, because they shed the blood of the saints and prophets. You have given them blood to drink. It's what they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. Fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. It was allowed to scorch people with fire. They're scorched by the fierce heat, but they cursed the name of God who had authority over the plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony. That's a great image. And the God of heaven, because of their pains and sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up in order to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw three foul spirits like frogs coming from the mouth of the dragon, from the mouth of the beast, and from the mouth of the false prophet. These are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for the battle on the great day of God the Almighty. See, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake in his clothes, not going about naked and exposed to shame. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a violent earthquake, such as had not occurred since people were upon the earth. So violent was that earthquake. The great city, <clears throat> what city that might be? 
the great city of Jerusalem, was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. God remembered great Babylon and gave her the wine cup of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, dropped from heaven on people until they cursed God for the plague of the hail. So fearful was that plague. All right. I heard a lot of, uh, what's the word? Um, Crazy. References to Exodus. Yes. There are a lot of references to Exodus. Um, one of the key differences between this cycle of seven and the other two that happened that occurred previously, but remember, they're not um, chronological in apocalyptic stuff. Each cycle of seven is kind of its own self-standing thing. So the, the seven uh, trumpets don't have to happen before this seven bowls can happen. And so uh, one of the things that difference, that, that's a big difference between uh, this and the other stories of the cycles of seven is that in the other ones, one third of the sea creatures were killed. Mm -hmm. One third of stuff. But this one, it's three thirds. You know, the entirety of the sea <coughs> was killed. Um, it's interesting that we're told the altar speaks. Did you, did you catch that part? Um, I don't know if you've been to plate cathedrals and stuff like that in Europe. Uh, before, but one that comes to my mind is St. Mark's Basilica in uh, Venice, in Italy. Uh, St. Mark's is where St. Mark is reported and believed to have been buried. And he is buried under the altar. Uh, it was a very common thing in the early church to bury the bodies of martyrs or saints under the altar. Um, if you go over to England, even, uh, it's a very common thing to bury prominent citizens mm -hmm. of the community mm -hmm. under the floor of the church, you know, um, or to, to do something similar to that. Um, and so the altar speaks, but the altar speaking is not a physical table talking, is it? I mean, it's, it's a reference to those saints who are, are there and kind of symbolized by that altar. So um, it's interesting that the Euphrates is said to dry up in order for the kings of the east um, to come in and take over. Now, I mean, this is a reference to the barbarian nations to the north and east of Rome um, in this situation. And um, so they all, so first of all, let me just say, it's amazing that this needs to be said, but let me just say, if ever you see an anthropomorphic frog coming out of the mouth of a dragon or a beast or a harlot or whatever, and it starts talking to you and performing miracles and signs, you're probably on acid. Don't, exactly. Don't do what that frog tells you. Does this need to be said? I mean, this is the idiocy with which this book gets like, who's going to listen to a dang frog? I mean, like, I, I've, back, gosh, what, 15 years ago? You remember those Budweiser commercials where the frog went, Budweiser, you know? Don't listen to them either. Uh, but if they start talking about like all, if they start performing miracles and doing all sorts of stuff and telling you to assemble at a place called Megiddo and fight against God, don't do it, okay? Does this need to be said? This is what, I mean, you read it right along with me, right? Like you, you saw what it said. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these frogs <laughs> convinced the nations and kings and armies of the world to assemble at Megiddo to fight God. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's humorous, isn't it? Can, 
Can you imagine that happening? I mean, I can imagine there being a little different explanation than this, but I'm not listening to a frog. I don't take order. I mean, now granted, some would say that I rank sixth in a family of four after Malachi and Duke, our English Springer Spaniels. <laughs> but they're not frogs. <laughs> At least I, I don't rank behind frogs. Um, anyway, so um, have y'all ever heard of the city of Megiddo? Mm -hmm. So in Israel, I'll just draw a crude map of Israel. We got the Sea of Galilee up here. We got the Jordan. We got the Dead Sea down here. Jerusalem is about here. Um, Megiddo is right here. And so there's some mountains right along here and right along here. Um, and so Megiddo is right there. Okay? Now, uh, Get my red pen. There's some trade routes that kind of go like this, and they kind of go like this, and they all converge right there in the Jezreel Valley. Heard of it before? In the Jezreel Valley, uh, at this place called Megiddo. Megiddo by the time of Jesus had been destroyed and rebuilt 13 times. By the time of Jesus, 13 times this city had been utterly destroyed and rebuilt. Why would anyone like yeah. rebuild a city that had been destroyed that much? Well, Oh, it's right there in that crossroads. Just like the city of Laodicea, if you remember it, back in the seven letters to the churches at the beginning of Revelation, uh, how they had no water, remember? Like they had to get uh, an aqueduct with the hot springs water piped down to them, and so their water was not hot or cold. It was kind of lukewarm. And they, to this day, folks in that area still will cool their water in jugs, in glasses, in mason jars, on their windowsills uh, because there's just no water to be found by drilling. Uh, so they have to get it from Hierapolis and the hot springs. Um, but at that point, they were able to tax people who came through there. And much is the case with Megiddo in the Jezreel Valley. Also, Megiddo is up on a hill. And being at the top of that valley, that's a strategically important spot militarily. You know, having the top of the hill is a whole lot more helpful than being down in the valley, right? Um, and so for that reason, you could tax people. You had a strategic military advantage if anyone was coming in. Um, so Megiddo was the site of 13 huge battles. Uh, by the time of Jesus, and even more so by the time Revelation was done. Um, and because of that, it would be kind of like in the U.S. us saying that the final battle between good and evil will take place at um, Gettysburg, you know, because Gettysburg was the site of some of the most severe bloodshed and most loss of life on both sides in the Civil War, you know, um, or Antietam. It would be kind of a, a similar sort of thing like that. Um, and so it's just fitting that the final battle would take place at Megiddo because so many battles had happened there. It was the place you went to go battle, <laughs> in other words. Now, in Hebrew, I've said that John and his Hebrew was really good, but his Greek was really bad. And when he didn't know the Greek word for something, he would just write it, the Hebrew name, in Greek letters. Okay? So, you, uh, there's some uh, sources that would put it as 
Megiddo City, Ear Megiddo, or another which is R Megiddo, or Mount Megiddo. When I lived over, well, when I was in there in Israel for two summers, um, that was one of the sites, I, one of the archaeological sites I wanted to see. There's not a, a town there at all now. Well, there's one close by. The closest town is called Afula. <laughs> and so, A-F-U-L-A. And when I was coming back to America, you are, you've got to sit through three hours worth of interrogation from Israeli soldiers to get on that plane to go back. And they're like, how long were you here? Oh, I was here all summer. And they're like, oh, well, let's start at the beginning. What day did you get here? You know, it was like, oh, I got here June 5th, you know. And what did you do June 5th? Well, I went to the hotel where we all were staying. And, uh, and what did you do June 6th? Well, I stayed at the hotel. And then uh, on the 7th, I was at the hotel that morning and then we went out to go digging uh, in the National Park in Ashkelon. Uh, and we did that from 5 in the morning until 12.30 in the afternoon. Then we went back and had a break until 4 p.m. and then we had to wash the pottery and the bones and stuff that we found and categorize them and all that and file them. And uh, then we had a lecture at 7 and then we all went to the bar down at the beach <laughs> until 11. And then we had to get up the next morning at five. And we did that until the you know, 10th of June. What did you do the 11th? I mean, it was, it was that sort of thing. It was that sort of like intense interrogation. So one, Kevin and I, uh, one of my friends, um, he, we, were, we went to Afula because we wanted to go see Megiddo. And we weren't part of a tour or anything like that. We were just students. And so we just took the bus to get up there. Uh, and um, so we had to find this hotel. And this was a crappy hotel, let me tell you. Like, there were mice in our room. It was, it was bad, but it was cheap. I mean, it was not expensive at all. And it was the only hotel in Afula. And so he's like, what did you do on... June the 23rd, and I was like, well, Kevin and I went to see uh, the architectural site, or the archaeological site of Megiddo, and where'd you stay? Well, we stayed in a hotel in Afula, and the dude says, there's a hotel in Afula? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you don't want to stay there. He's like, no, I wouldn't. He's like, I, I, I'm an Israeli army person, and I ain't staying in Afula. <laughs> so that, that was pretty funny. Anyway, um, so we go to Megiddo and to, to see this, this archaeological site. And um, anyway, it was, it was kind of fun. But going back to Revelation, uh, the final battle between good and evil, these frogs have called the kings and nations of the earth and militaries to assemble to fight God at Megiddo. And so then this great battle happens between the forces of good and evil, right? Yep. What happens? Hell's going. Yeah. The forces of evil assemble. Forces of good are nowhere to be seen. The forces of evil assemble and they're crushed by hailstones. There's just a big storm and they all get squashed by hailstones. Is that what you think the Battle of Armageddon would be like? That's what it says. If we read our Bibles, that's what it says. I did not grow up hearing that. I did not grow up reading it because guess what? I didn't read what it said. I just assumed that's what it was because, well, you know, I mean, I can get the cliff notes of uh, the Scarlet Letter and know what happens to Hester Prynne, you know. Uh, so I just assumed that whatever I was told 
from somebody on TV must be not inaccurate, right? <laughs> well, I mean, that's not what we have pictured here in Revelation, is it? When you read what it actually says, the Battle of Armageddon never happens. <laughs> it's not a battle, it's a storm. <laughs> and the people listening to the frogs get squashed by hailstones. I mean, serves them right for listening to a <laughs> magic working frog. Like, did, did you know there were magic working frogs in the Bible? Like, I mean, but again, read what it says, not what it doesn't say. It's another example that we get of just how crazy interpretations of this crazy book can be when you don't understand it in its appropriate context. Uh, but reading it in its appropriate context, it makes a lot more sense. It's still a little bit crazy. You gotta wonder if John was on acid, right, Abel? Yeah. Um, or something. I mean, magic working frogs. Uh, well, we've got Kermit. We do have Kermit, you know. And the Budweiser, the Budweiser and the frogs. Budweiser frogs. Uh, and Kermit just got inducted into the uh, Smithsonian's um, National Sound Archive, you know, for the for his song. Um, Which one? The Rainbow Connection. Yeah. Anyway, um, so what do we make of this? Um, there's no Battle of Armageddon. In the book of Revelation. <laughs> that's one of the biggest things that's supposed to happen. It's Armageddon. Ah! You know, when it turns out, um, God doesn't operate by the standards of humanity in the world. If God was going to assemble an army, God could assemble an army and squash whoever. But that's not how God operates, is it? God doesn't send a mighty general, a lion. God sends a slaughtered lamb. Uh, in further point that God doesn't work in the ways of the world. And he calls us not to operate on the world's system of understanding either. Um, Revelation 17. Can I go on? Sound good? Questions? Comments? As long as you're not a magic working frog. <laughs> now I'm suspicious of every frog I see. Every time I read this, I'm like, oh, frogs, really? Oh, and the, they could be that evil? <laughs> and the, uh, the one from Bugs Bunny. The dancing frog. Oh, yeah, the, the dancing, dancing frog. singing frog. Yeah, who sings? How's it going? No, baby. Hello, my darling. Hello, my darling. Drag my gal. Sorry. <laughs> oh, goodness. We're having too much fun with this. Uh, Revelation 17, verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I'll show you the judgment of the great whore who's seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And with the wine of whose fornication, the inhabitants of the earth have become drunk. So he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. Have you seen that before? Seven heads and ten horns. Remember back to that like super fast thing that I went through last week? There was a, a beast with seven heads and ten horns, um, and Rome is the city built on seven hills. Um, Anyway, and you remember in apocalyptic, heads and horns represent rulers and animals represent countries. And so this is a reference to Rome. Uh, the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her fornication. And on her forehead was written the name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of whores, and of earth's abominations. <laughs> Don't name your child that. 
<laughs> it's setting them up for failure if you do. <laughs> oh, sorry. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly amazed. But the angel said to me, why are you so amazed? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to ascend from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will be amazed when they see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. What? That is the polar opposite oh, of geez. the way that God gets referenced. He who was and is, is and is, is to come the one who was and is not and is going to its destruction is the opposite of the names used to refer to God. Uh, however, once again, the word Antichrist never comes up here. Don't confuse the two or conflate the two. Uh, and I love this, verse 9. This calls for a mind that has wisdom. <laughs> John's trying to tell us as we're reading this, Okay, here's the crazy part, and I don't want the Roman soldiers outside my door to get this, but y'all can because guess what? You're not dumb. <laughs> it's a, it, it, so, so they say, uh, this calls for a vine that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Also, they are seven kings, ten of whom... Uh, five have fallen, one is living, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are the ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are united in yielding their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he said to me, The waters that you saw, where the whore is seated, the, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages, much like the Roman Empire. Um, and the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the whore. <laughs> they'll make her desolate and naked, and they'll devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put into their hearts to carry out his purpose by agreeing to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Rome. Rome. In case you didn't know, this calls for a mind that has wisdom. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's, it's like John's being sarcastic to us in some sense, you know? Um, and I, uh, I, I'm just always, I'm reminded when I read this of reggae music and Bob Marley. Any of y'all listen to Bob Marley? Yes. <laughs> uh, and Rastafarians. Um, you know, the Rastafarians, they're crazy. Um, but they, uh, they think Haile Selassie was Jesus, basically. Uh, old school emperor of Ethiopia back in the day and they're always talking about Babylon and chanting down Babylon you know uh, and Babylon is a reference not to the city in Iraq but to western white society you know like us yeah, yeah, yeah you Jude <laughs> punishing those Rastafarians you know um, and and uh, all that goes along with that. So anyway, uh, the seven heads and ten horns. L let me let me talk about that for a minute. Uh, the number ten of those is really what's important because it signifies that all the Caesars, all the emperors of Rome, are on the side of the beast. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and if you start with Nero, um, then you get. Uh, let me a great little chart in my trusty Harper Collins study Bible. If you go from, you can go in many different ways of counting, but if you go from Julius Caesar uh, on through Nerva, uh, you get 
ten rulers because at one point there was a triumvirate uh, in 68 and 69 uh, with Galba, Otho, and Vitellius. Uh, and then Vespasian takes over after that and Titus and Domitian. And, you know, like I said, Domitian was ruling from 81 to 96. And this book was likely written towards the end of Domitian's reign. Uh, and so we get this, this counting of emperors uh, going back to Julius Caesar to be 10, basically. There are different ways you can go about it. And why does that even matter? Well, it doesn't. Ultimately, the number 10 matters more than who those 10 were. Because remember, in apocalyptic literature, the numbers are symbolic. And so what's more important than who those emperors were and how we count them is that all of them were on the side of the beast and none of them were on the side of God. So that's what matters more so. However, that's one of the ways when we look at that part of John uh, and, and uh, the book of Revelation, when we look at that section of it, that helps us to date when it was that John of Patmos was writing this to those seven churches. And so it's pretty easy to pinpoint with that. Why? Because this calls for wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty easy to pinpoint chronologically what time this book is written for, you know, with, with quite a bit of accuracy even for the ancient world. Uh, within a decade or so, we can point to this being towards the, very easily we can say with, with a lot of certainty that this was written likely in the last decade or two of um, the first century AD. I mean, I, I think that's kind of cool that we can, you know, go to that and, and you know, work our way backwards, so to speak. Um, but like I said, uh, going on through here, 18 uh, verses 1 through 24, we get uh, a big song. Uh, I, I like to picture Bob Marley singing it, uh, chanting, uh, chant down Babylon. You know, alas, alas, the great city, Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Um, and uh, everybody in the world who thought Rome was so great are going to be in shock. And Babylon is going to fall and going to fall quickly. Um, and all the nations of the world will be amazed. Hey, look at that. So in, in a sense, it is little apoc apocalyptic. I mean, he's, in a he's, sense it is, but it's talking about the past, not the future. Uh, but you, you don't think he's actually talking about the fall of Rome? Well, the fall of Rome the, the fall of didn't happen until much later. Yeah, I mean, um, with the the Goths and all that. But it, it, you know that phrase, Rome wasn't created in a day. No, but it was sacked in a week. <laughs> you know, and nobody ever says that part uh, because you can work your tail off for centuries building the Roman Empire. And no, it wasn't built in a day, but it was sacked in a week. You know, it doesn't take much to bring it. Bill Cosby. You know, think about think about that. That man built an empire of of like he he was one of the few comedians who was clean who didn't cuss. It's hard to be really funny and not cuss. Uh, I mean, Chris Rock can't do it. He's hilarious, but he couldn't do it if he couldn't cuss. You know, <laughs> a lot of these other guys couldn't do it either. Uh, but Bill Cosby did. And everybody loved him. And everybody loved him. And then, then in an instant, Bryce. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take long, does it? It's and the sad thing is, all. yeah. But the sad thing is, too, is that, like, um, even if those accusations, which I think everyone agrees turned out to be true, uh, were false, even if they had been false, much the same would have happened to the dude. 
Um, I'm not trying to have uh, empathy for, or sympathy for him, maybe some empathy, I guess, but I'm not trying to justify what he did. But, you know, you look at Rome, you look at Bill Cosby, you look at all sorts of stuff, and it doesn't take much to just ruin uh, a whole empire, does it? Um, anyway, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Matt. No, no. Was I, I, you know, I didn't know, you know, like I said, it's either, or, or is, I guess it's more so of a foretelling of the triumph of Christianity over... Yeah, paganism. yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's in lots of ways um, a more... And in this sense, this is one of the other... Re and I didn't mention this in the beginning, Chris, but to kind of follow back, double back onto your question of why is this book in our Bibles. The earliest way of understanding this book, outside of understanding it apocalyptically, you know, from that Jewish perspective of apocalyptic literature, the, the next way that it was understood for centuries was as an allegory, you know, uh, which almost got there, you know, because, yeah, an allegory makes a lot more sense, a, a symbolic way of telling something, you know, like uh, slow and steady wins the race, to go with Aesop's fables and the horse, or the, I'm sorry, the, the hare and the uh, turtle, tortoise and the hare, right? Notice I didn't bring up frogs. Uh, um, but, it, you know, this, this way of understanding it as an allegory of good defeating evil. There we go. That's what's going to happen in the end. Be on the side of good. Well, understanding Revelation as an allegory is not totally incorrect. You know, I mean, it, it kind of gets there. It gets most of the way there even, and it doesn't don't go down a crazy road. <laughs> um, so, yay, way to go on that one. Um, and it was largely Roman Catholic interpreters of Scripture who were um, instrumental in viewing the book of Revelation as an allegory. And up until, you know, the the 20th century, I would even say, uh, that was the predominant way of, of viewing it, apart from the Niagara Bible Conference and Schofield and, and Darby and all these guys in the, the 18 and 1900s. Um, uh, and they went crazy. And sadly, in America, that craziness is what we go back to in thinking about what this book means as far as like popular culture goes and popular religion goes, you know, I mean, those guys that get on TV and get all red in the face telling you to hate the same people that they hate and that God hates the same people that they hate. I don't have to name names, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of them out there. Um, and so it, anyway, that supplanted the largely Roman Catholic way of reading this book as an allegory uh, in the 19th, 18th, 19th, 20th centuries uh, in the history of interpretation as far as this goes. So um, finding those other apocalyptic writings in Nag Hammadi and with the Dead Sea Scrolls and elsewhere, uh, that was a, a big help not just to scholars, I feel like, but to all of us as, as Christians trying to read this book and determine what it means for us. Um, and also what it doesn't mean. Um, sadly, it's a whole lot easier to determine what it doesn't mean than what it does mean lots of times. But if we follow these apocalyptic rules, so to speak, if we follow those standards of apocalyptic literature um, and we see in context how apocalyptic writings function and what context they were in originally, then it becomes really a no-brainer in my mind at least 
that this is a much better way of understanding this writing, and it also simplifies it greatly. You know, instead of worrying about magic working frogs, um, you and instead of worrying about a, a seven-headed beast with ten horns with a whore riding it. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, I mean, instead of those sorts of crazy imagery, we get, oh, Rome, the world, the secular world, the world as opposed to the church, you know, um, those forces that are opposed to God more so than just those forces that are whatever we might call them. You know, I, I think it, it opens and broads up a, a, a much better avenue for us to, to learn from this book. But anyway, well, I uh, am done with that chapter. If y'all are done, are okay with me being done with it? Is that, are there further questions or comments, thoughts? As long as they don't involve you materializing a mag magical frog or something. Yes, Abram. You said something about Old Testament apocryphal writings. Yes. Daniel. Uh, yeah, the first seven chapters of the book of Daniel are apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. There's some other ones too. Uh, there's some, some books that are non-canonical uh, that did not make it into even you know the expanded version of our Bibles. Um, and those are typically known not just as the Apocrypha uh, or as a apocryphal books, you know, like in the adjective form. Uh, but many of them are known, instead of being called apocryphal, uh, as being known pseudepigraphal. Um, so let me write that word up here. It's a fun word. Um, I've got a lot of <laughs> So this is the adjectival form. Um, those of you who know some Greek prefixes, pseudo, you know what that means? False, false, false fake. Yeah. Um, and then, well, I'll, I'll put a E right here. Epigraphy. So we got epi. And then Garafo. Garafo. G R A P H. That like a graph or a right. writing on the map? Mm -hmm. Writings. Yeah. So an epi kind of means around. So we have fake around writings. <laughs> it's basically all pseudepigraphal means. Okay. Um, and there is a, uh, there, there are two. Uh, if, if you would ever like to check them out, I'm happy to. I'm not gonna let you borrow them. Oh, because I'm picky about those. I'll let you borrow other books. Picky about all my books, but um, so there is a an Old Testament apocrypha uh, two volume set by this guy named James H. Charlesworth, and he actually is a member of the Western North Carolina Conference of the Methodist Church. And he taught um, at Princeton for most of his time uh, before he retired. He's really old now. But um, anyway, I, like I've never gotten to see him at conference. Um, he's, he's too important to show up at Junaluska. <laughs> I was just thinking, I wish I'd been at Junaluska. I mean, Junaluska. this guy, James Charlesworth, he's way too important to show up at Junaluska for something. Uh, he might show up if, if the Pope invited him to Rome and Baghdad City, you know, but, uh, or if the Archbishop of Canterbury invited him there, uh, but he's not showing up to Junaluska. Uh, anyway, Old Testament pseudepigrapha and apocrypha. Um, he has a, a two-volume set of that. 
And then there's a New Testament Apocrypha um, volume, two volume set as well. Um, and I'm drawing a blank on the guy who edited that. But in, and then there's some other ones. There's some, um, some books that are compilations of the writings from Nag Hammadi and the Dead Sea Scrolls um, and some other random ones here and there that also have some, some more of these apocryphal, uh, I'm sorry, uh, apocalyptic books. So, the pseudepigraphal ones, those are the ones that are crazy. Uh, for instance, one of the New Testament pseudepigraphal books is the Gospel of Thomas. It was in the, the news a lot 15 years ago, maybe. Um, Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Code. The Gospel of Thomas gets talked about a lot. Um, and the Gospel of Thomas, it has some things in it that seem pretty normal. And then it's got other stuff that's just insane. The Gospel of Peter. Oh, so Peter wrote a gospel, huh? Well, if he lived to be 500 years old, he wrote a gospel because it's 500 years old. It was written 500 years after Jesus was dead, you know, or crucified and resurrected. That's not written by Peter, you know. Anyway, so there are a number of books that claim uh, to be written by apostles or prominent folks in the early church that actually there's no way they could have been. And if you just look at what it, some of them say, the Gospel of Peter, for instance, has a talking cross. <laughs> like the cross starts talking. The book of Revelation has magic working frogs. Anyway, just kidding. But... Um, so we get pseudepigraphal, or pseudepigraphal uh, and apocryphal stuff uh, abounds. Uh, and most of these like words that are hard to understand are not fancy. They're just foreign. You know, they're, they're really pretty primitive words when it comes down to it. Um, they're just Greek and Hebrew and Latin. So. Thanks, y'all. Hope everybody has a good week. Thank you.